You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. The guest today is Kate Rayworth. She is the author of Donut Economics, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist. Kate, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Thank you very much. So you open your book with a discussion of some of the student movements uh, in economics or maybe in opposition to economics, uh, particularly the ones that protested the annual meeting of the American Economic Association back in 2015. So what can you tell me about those student movements as they relate to the theme of your book? So I was a student of economics 25 years ago, and I was as frustrated, I believe, um, and partly disillusioned by the theories I was learning because I felt that they weren't addressing the issues that I thought were core to be tackled in the world. What I'm finding, I, I walked away thinking, I don't want to be called an economist. I don't feel proud of that training. And what I find fascinating about today's students is that they seem to be going through the very same frustration but they are organized and they're networked. And many of them who I've spoken to have said that at first they thought they were alone in um, their dismay at the theory that we're learning. But then through international networks, they realized that there were many others thinking like them. And I think it's been fantastic for enabling them to organize and realize that they were, in fact, a movement and that they had many common doubts and questions about economics. So you've got the Rethinking Economics Movement. Um, the pluralistic economy movement coming from Germany, um, the ICPE, the International Student Initiative for Pluralism in Economics, all putting forward multiple ways of looking at the economy. Their passion is pluralism in economics and ensuring that all different perspectives are given space in the curriculum and that one learns to ask which kind of perspective is useful at this particular moment. I'm coming from a slightly different perspective. I agree that pluralism is great in a training, but I have, for the purposes that I'm thinking of in terms of the 21st century goals and values, have picked out a few of those perspectives that I believe particularly well equip us uh, to tackle the 21st century's major challenges, such as climate change, extreme inequality, financial crisis. So I've particularly leaned towards insights from ecological economics, feminist, institutional behavioral economics, complexity economics. And my excitement is drawing those together because I think there's a danger that these niches become very comfortable in themselves, that one becomes a feminist economist or an ecological economist and goes to your own conferences, writes on your own organization's blogs, publishes in those journals. And therefore, these new insights remain fragmented at the margins. Where the real value added in my mind lies is bringing them together and starting to ask what happens when they dance on the same page. So that's one of the things I set out to do in writing my book. Yeah, I guess uh, at first I had not a lot of sympathy for those student protesters, but they have a bit of a point in that the economics we teach them in in their undergraduate degrees, you know, going up to the third year, is all stuff from the 1960s. And, and all the schools of thought you mentioned, the ecological, behavioral, feminist, and complexity, you know, all of those are things that came out since the 1960s, and and very little of that is captured in what we we teach at the undergraduate level. So I, I can see where the the frustration comes from. So the the center of your book is what you call the donut. Of course, the title Donut Economics. Um, now this is not an actual tasty uh, dessert treat, but uh, but a, a sort of diagram that you used to capture sort of the, the crux of your, your ideas and your, your framework. So could you tell me about the donut? What exactly is it? So imagine a picture of an American donut, the round kind with a hole in the middle. It's the shape of the diagram that I found myself drawing in 2011 when I was trying to draw a picture of a way of understanding 21st century well-being. Because now that we're in the Anthropocene, the era in which humanity is a major driver of change at the Earth system scale, I think our understandings of what well-being is for humanity needs to evolve. And you could say that there are two sides to well-being in a very simple way. On the one hand, every person needs to have the resources and means to meet their human rights and their needs, be it to food and health care, education, housing, 
uh, community, access to networks, so that every person can lead a life of opportunity and dignity. But at the same time, we depend on the fundamental life systems of this planet. We depend upon a stable climate, upon healthy oceans, fertile soils, a protective ozone layer. So our well-being is dependent upon these two things, which hasn't been represented clearly, I think, in previous understandings of well-being and certainly not sufficiently well in economics. So the donut tries to present those both on the page. Imagine that American donut. In the hole in the middle is a space where people are falling short on life's most essential needs. They have, they're falling short on their access to food or income or their access to energy. So we want to get everybody out of the hole in the middle over the inner crust that I've called a social foundation of well-being. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we don't collectively go beyond that outer crust, which would be a space of ecological or planetary overshoot, overshoot in terms of pressure of climate change, of excessive water withdrawal, so that we actually change the flow of ri rivers, uh, pressure on the ozone layer, on biodiversity loss, on land use change, because then we actually start to kick the Earth system out of the state that's been so extraordinarily benevolent for humanity over the last 11,000 years. So this diagram, this donut shape, says, make sure nobody's falling short on life's essentials, no one's left in the middle of the circle, but make sure we're not collectively over pushing, um, overshooting those planetary boundaries. So we find our safe and just space for the whole of humanity between that social foundation and planetary ceiling. When I first drew this, I like drawing things, I think very visually. And so I've always drawn economic concepts. When I first drew it, I thought, I find that pleasing. Uh, I shared it with a few people and they said, that's, that's interesting, let's publish it. I was, to be honest, gobsmacked. I mean, really surprised by the reaction to it. The number of people who contacted me internationally and said, this is how I've always thought of sustainable prosperity or sustainable development. I've just never seen the picture before. And it triggered in me a real fascination with the power of pictures, with the power of the way that we draw things, which is not really ever a central theme of an economic education. But it made me realize that, of course, visual images go deep into our visual cortex and they stay there. I think they linger like graffiti long after the equations and the words have faded and they matter a great deal more than we give them credibility for. So that insight of the power of changing paradigms and thinking through drawing new pictures, it drove me back to my economics textbooks. And I agree with what you say that the students were frustrated because what they learn in, let's call it Econ 101 or an undergraduate degree, uh, doesn't embody all these new insights. But that's the point, because the vast majority of people who ever study economics only study it at that level. They then go off and become journalists, politicians, policymakers, business leaders. So rather than saying, well, that's just an undergraduate level, you know, what matters is what happens afterwards. I would say the opposite. What matters at the undergraduate level is the most important, because this is the mindset that shapes public policy. It becomes the mother tongue of public policy. So it matters hugely. And if we can draw new images, such as the donut, that starts to say, actually, here's, here's a way of reconceptualizing what well-being looks like in the 21st century, then let's go back to those textbooks and look at the diagrams that we were taught that are engraved in our minds, whether it's the supply and demand curve, uh, the circular flow of money curve, the Kuznets curve. These things speak to us for long after we realize they're even influencing our mindset. So I wanted to revisit them figure out how they were deeply influencing the frame that I had been given for the world and challenge them and redraw them for the 21st century. Yeah, it's true that, that the Econ 101 level, that's, that's when we've got the captive audience and in, in some ways literally captive because it's, you know, they're taking it for a degree requirement and they, you know, can't get into the labor market without it. But yeah, as we as we mm. get more advanced, you get smaller classes, you get fewer people. And, you know, at uh, the level I'm at right now, I'm a PhD candidate. You know, I, I have a dozen classmates, not 100, not 200, like in the first year classes. And and so where where those other, you know, uh, 100 people went out into the, the labor force or to policy or places, I hope that what they take with them from economics is positive. It helps them and it helps the world. So can I jump in there? Because I yes. really worry that it's not. You see, I really worry uh, that the frames, the fundamental frames that, as you quite rightly said, us uh, have been hanging around from the 60s. And actually, the 60s got them from the 1870s. Um, so 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, these frames are a hundred years, I would say, out of date, but we still work with them. And those are the frames that are framing the way students think about the economy. So, for example, we speak of the environment as an externality. Right there is a very powerful frame. It's external to our central frame of reference. Mm. If it's external, it's at the margins. Now, we, as an economist, you go, well, but an externality, a lot of economics is about how we should deal with externalities. But uh, if you think of the work of cognitive scientists such as George Lakoff, who talks about the power of framing and the words we use that create these metaphors that we live by, it matters a great deal whether we call something an externality or not. So I, I think that we are doing a huge disservice, not just to economic students who study one year and then go off and carry on with their, their career, taking that economic mindset with them. We're doing a huge disservice to the whole of humanity because this mindset shapes the way we are all governed, uh, that shapes public debate on the radio, shapes debate in business. So I'm most passionate about transforming that undergraduate education because that is the powerful one. It's not to me, I'm not so focused on what happens at the graduate or PhD level. Then people go off into specialities. Then they realize and they learn about all the nuances and the new thinking. But it's the fundamental lesson that goes, as you said, to 100 students. That's what matters. Mm. So the subtitle of your book is Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist. So I think what we're going to do is go through them one by one and, you know, hopefully we get to all of them. But uh, if, if not, we uh, might diverge along the way to, to discuss the particular points of, of, uh, of these seven ways. So your first of the seven ways is that we need to change the goal by which you mean GDP. Uh, so talk about GDP and what you mean by changing the goal. Right. So I, I see that uh, as economics evolve, and if you go back to the origins of economics and Adam Smith, economists actually defined economics by the goal of what they were trying to do. Um, Smith defined it around uh, enabling people to provide for themselves and having a sufficient income for public provisioning. So and the early economists defined economics in terms of the outcome, the goal of what the economy was trying to create. But as the desire to make economics more of a science evolved, that statement of the outcome was removed because sciences don't generally define themselves around an outcome. And so it was turned more into a means. And I believe that at the heart of economics, a vacuum opened up in terms of what the economy was for. And when Simon Kuznets in the 1930s first calculated the GDP metric, of course, he calculated as GNP at the time, gross national product, and the power of that metric uh, coming out of the Depression and then going into the world wars, that you could use that metric to to predict and govern a country's production output. And then when we start having one year to the next GDP calculations, we can look at how the country, how the economy has grown over time. Then we start getting international comparisons. Now you've got a very, very powerful metric that's starting to say who's growing fastest. And in the era of a Cold War, that kind of competition between the US and the USSR became a very, very tight one over who's turning out more stuff. And so GDP became a de facto goal. Of course, no economist would say GDP is the goal of the economy. But in again, coming back to public language, the discourse, the way it's used by politicians, the way it's reported in the press, it's as if GDP is the goal of the economy and, and GDP, is a necess GDP increase is a necessary sign of health of the economy. And yet, we know that in the, today, although GDP is continuing to grow, we have extraordinary uh, environmental challenges, challenges of climate change, of, of unprecedented biodiversity loss, of extreme land conversion, That challenges that are not at all being reflected in this increasing GDP. And of course, since the work of Thomas Piketty, in recent decades, it's become extremely clear that just a, a nationally growing GDP or even an average per capita growing GDP does not in any way reflect the distributive nature of that economic growth. So we have an economy that may have a growing GDP, but it is degenerative by design. It's degenerating the living planet on which it's based. And it's divisive in that majority of the increase in income is going to the richest in society. So it's no way reflecting the deeper values of well-being that we need. So I very uh, boldly like to say, what if we took away GDP from being this de facto goal of what the economy is for? Take the long view out over the 21st century. We're so used to looking at the short term, the quarterly or the next year. But take the long view across this whole century. What is humanity actually going to try to achieve this century. We have the 
possibility of meeting the needs and rights of 10 billion or more people this century within the means of the planet, but only if we transform the economy that we currently have. So I propose getting into the donut, that safe and just space between social and planetary boundaries, where no one is falling short on life's needs, but we are not overshooting our pressure on the planet. I propose that as the transformative goal for the 21st century. And to me, that's the generational challenge we face. Can we do it? I believe it can be done, but will we actually make it happen? And as a young economist, if you're a student today coming into economics, economics meaning household management, couldn't be more relevant today. The question is, what's the economic mindset that will give us the greatest chance of achieving this 21st century goal? So that's why I believe we need to transform the goal. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned GDP becoming a target. And as the the saying goes, when a metric becomes a target, it ceases to be a good metric. So, I mean, you know, the Soviets knew that they were in a competition to get higher GDP and, and were you know, doing things to falsify their their numbers. And I think right. that America was do, doing similar things. Maybe they couldn't, you know, outright just make up numbers, but they could certainly push for higher GDP in ways that weren't, um, you know, that didn't necessarily make people better off. And we, we do try when we teach GDP to uh, emphasize that difference. We give the example of if you marry your housekeeper, um, then, you know, since you and she keeps cooking and cleaning for you, but now you're not paying her, GDP goes down, but nothing has really changed. You know, and we that's we, right. We try to give examples like that where you know the person's well being or the society's well being and GDP are not perfectly aligned. But then in the public debate, I think that's lost, and also in in empirical, uh, you know, in a lot of empirical work, since GDP is what we can measure and uh, well being kind of isn't um not directly at least we uh we sometimes lose the the subtlety and the the distinction between those right and if i can just pick up right there i think that's a great point and the examples you give are, are good examples to show people the limits of what gdp does and doesn't reflect but I, let's just kick that on to looking at the second of the seven ways to think that I'm proposing, because precisely as you say, um, if you marry your housekeeper and stop paying them, then uh, you're taking that work out of the market and taking it into the household. And all, so I believe that the second way we need to transform our thinking is recognizing that the market is not self-contained, but it's embedded in different forms of provisioning, which are embedded within society, embedded within the living world. So Again, I, I went back to the circular flow of, of income diagram that was drawn by first drawn by Paul Samuelson in his 1948 classic textbook and has become a standard diagram in every textbook. It puts the idea of the market exchange, the heart of what we see as the economy. So it's the biggest picture that economists have to show a student. This is the macro economy. It's um, households and businesses in exchange of labor and resources. In, to, in return, they get wages, which they spend on goods. And so the spending goes round and round and we can use it to see the Keynesian multiplier. And we can also see that uh, banks are involved in sort of loops coming off this the government taking taxes and reinvesting public spending or trade. These are all loops coming off it, but it's a circular, self-contained system. It's a very powerful diagram that Samuelson first drew, this circular flow diagram. But again, it places at the heart of the idea of what the economy is, is the market. And yet if we step back, the market is just one of four essential provisioning systems that we all depend upon, I will say, every day. So there's the market in which we produce and exchange goods and services for money or barter. But there's also the state, which takes public revenue and provides public goods and services. There's also the household, where goods and services such as, as you described, the house cleaner, housekeeper turned wife might provide cooking, cleaning, washing, laundering, raising the children, teaching the children, socializing the children, absolutely essential services and goods that are critical to reproducing society and reproducing labor every day. And lastly, the commons, that sphere of self-organizing where people get together without the injection of the market, without the oversight of the state, but they self-organize to create goods and services that they value. Now, when you start there and say, actually, the economy is about provisioning products and services that people value, the market, the state, the household, and the commons, all very different characteristics, but a fascinating interaction between all four. 
I wouldn't want to live in a society that lacked any one of them. I wouldn't want to live without the market, certainly wouldn't want to live without the household, nor without the state and nor without the commons. And I would, I often say to my own students, imagine yourself through your day to day, think of all the interactions you've had today. I'll bet that you've had an interaction in each of those four realms. So we can then start asking more interesting questions when we take any particular kinds of goods or services, be it transport or education or healthcare, which, what are the attributes of these different forms of provisioning? And what is going to be the most effective way for producing and distributing those goods and services? It may well be that it involves several of them because I think market state, household and commons actually often work best when they work together. Um, most of the innovative kinds of enterprise are between the, let's say it's a public-private partnership, so it's market and state, or it might be a state in the commons or the, the market in the commons. Any enterprise that's built off open source software is a market commons collaboration. So to me, this is the really rich space. But if we only start with Samuelson's diagram of the circular flow, we've already dived in with the deep assumption that the economy is essentially the market and these other spheres of organizing are peripheral. Yeah, I, before you mentioned open source, I was going to bring it up because, uh, of course, in economics, we focus a lot on the the tragedy of the commons. But in your book, you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, the creativity of the commons. And it's funny that uh, economists talk about the tragedy of the commons and think about it a lot and then, you know, turn around and use R for their statistical modeling, which, of course, <laughs> is free and open source. And, you know, if if you really strongly believe in the tragedy of the commons model, it shouldn't even be possible to, to, for something like R to be as good as, or I think better than, than a lot of the alternatives. That's a wonderful example. And of course, the, the tr Garrett Harding's piece in 1968, which he called the tragedy of commons, when people now look more closely at that and say, hang on, Garrett, what you're talking about is the tragedy of open access uh, common pool resources where there's no governance, no community, no punishment for exploiting them. Of course, that will be quickly exploited and dried up. But as Eleanor Ostrom came along in the 1970s and said, hang on a minute, I can go around the world and find communities that are sharing a watershed, uh, managing water in rice paddies, all sorts of different communities that are managing commons. And actually, they have very clear rules, very clear membership. There are clear punishments for violating the rules. Uh, there's communication between the members. So if these criteria are in place, then self-organizing in managing commons can actually be a triumph and not a tragedy at all. So it's a really good example of the, the tragedy of the commons became a very dominant phrase, uh, which means this commons organizing becomes dismissed. And as, as you rightly said, the digital commons, I think, is building on Ostrom's work, which is very much based in the natural commons. But it's the rise of the digital commons, especially that the younger generation are so part of and contributing to, whether it's um, Linux software or, as you say, R um, or Wikipedia we see the value of this and we see that we can be part of a community of digital commoners co-creating something incredibly value and incredibly dynamic. And if we ignore that out of economics and just dismiss the commons as a tragedy, well, we're, we're ignoring one of the most dynamic spaces of the economy. Yeah, it, it's, you know, we focus on the individual incentive to create and, and when when you don't own your intellectual property, when you can't turn around and sell it, there's some sense in which you your incentive is reduced, but on the other hand, when we lock up all every idea with a patent, it makes it very hard to develop new ideas that build on and combine other ideas because you know you have to then you're held up by all the the different patent owners and and the law and and it becomes you know innovation becomes the realm of of uh, in intellectual property lawyers instead of uh, creative inventors. Yeah, I, I do think we've overemphasized the tragedy of the commons. It 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 is a real thing. There is a real, you know, margin on which it's true that having incomplete property rights reduces your incentive to produce, but it's not the only margin and probably it seems like in many areas it's not the most important one. Right, and there are also there are other aspects of people who don't only want to reap a, ret uh, a return on innovation, but actually are inspired to co-create. There's a whole other side of us that wants to cooperate and collaborate. So why is it people will do a long, hard day of work at the office and then go home and code 
until 2 a.m. contributing to a patch for a piece of software. And, and of course, they have their name on it. So there is a reward for innovation. It's called recognition and status, and it may well not be financial. So we, are, we, we value rewards in many different kinds of ways. And the, the market focus only uh, counts or, or notices that financial reward, which comes from having uh, intellectual property rights, but if we look at the wider human motivation, we can see that actually people feel deeply rewarded and acknowledged if they're part of a community where they're contributing their time for free, but they know that they're building something greater. So again, it's about the rules and the structure and the membership and the recognition. Uh, I'll give an example, the Open Building Institute which has been set up in recent, uh, just last year, aims to share online and co-create designs for housing that could be built um, and adapted to any condition that is using renewable energy, local building materials. And the people who are passionate about this are even more passionate to share their ideas because they've got a bigger vision than I want to reap the return myself. Rather, I want I want benefits of feeling that I've contributed, but I want to know that this idea is expanding and being shared around the world. So it's a very different mentality about feeling the reaping value from your innovation. It's not a financial value. It's a, a sense of making change in the world and feeling recognized by the community to with, with which you're participating. Uh, and of course, this is a divergence from our model of uh, economic man or the homo economicus being sort of narrowly self-interested. So I'll use that to tie into your third point, which is to nurture human nature, um, which is, of course, your critique of the economic man. So tell me about that third point. So the model of economic man that lies at the heart of uh, mainstream theory, I, I drew a little picture of him for my book because I like pictures. Of course, he's never actually drawn, but I've drawn a little picture of him um, and said, if you, if you imagine him in your, your head, the way he's described theoretically is that he's standing alone with money in his hand, a calculator in his head, ego in his heart and nature at his feet. And it's a very a very narrow version of who we actually are. It, in, it tells us that we are competitive primarily, uh, that we have our own interests at heart. And of course, we can extend his utility function to care for others, but the default model is of self-interest. The real concern around this model, and I've, one of the areas I found most fascinating in researching for my book, is that work by Robert Frank and others has found that when students learn about this model of rational economic man, they actually become more like him. So over time, students going from the first year to the third year, they, they rate characteristics such as altruism and compassion as less valuable by the time they're reaching the third year. Uh, they will behave more competitively in a game theory simulation as Robert Frank puts it, because um, we fear being called the chump. And so that fear of being the fool who doesn't um, smartly make sure they secure their gains, it brings out the worst in us because we suspect the worst in others. So I find it really fascinating that who economics tells us we are actually has a power to shape who we become. And that means we need to pay a great deal of attention to the models of humanity we place in the center of economics. And of course, this is an area that's very rich in new thinking with the whole movement of behavioral economics, or let's say the influx of cognitive science from Daniel Kahneman, Kahneman um, and others in neuroscience. But understanding that, yes, we're competitive, but we also ha are wired for empathy. We're wired to cooperate. We are, in fact, the most social of all species, of all mammals. We're, I think, um, competing with a naked mole rat in terms of our sociability. And when it comes to being social with those who are not family, we far outclass any other animals. So our sociability is crucial to the understanding that we have of ourselves. So but it's not just about overcoming that, that competitive idea and thinking that we also cooperate um, and again, let's think about the household economy. It's full of cooperation. I mean, any parent knows that so much of their time becomes immersed in raising children, sometimes with open arms, but sometimes with gritted teeth. It's tiring. I have eight-year-old twins, so I really feel this. It's uh, tiring nonstop work. And that, that socially um, constructing and, and enabling them and educating them to be social beings to join society, it's an enormous education that goes on within the home. Yes, we, we teach our, we, we 
celebrate our children when they compete and when they do well, but we celebrate that they compete well as well as good competitors. And we put massive attention on their ability to cooperate. So economic theory needs to recognize that we are wired for cooperation. Also, that we don't have fixed values that we bring into the world, but our values are shaped um, and in fact can be activated uh, every day. And there's wonderful work by Schwartz, who talks about um, his value circumplex, he's found around 10 basic values that he's found have resonate in every society. Um, and these can be switched on. So they might be um, hedonism, uh, benevolence, competitiveness, status, collaboration so across the whole spectrum and these can be switched on and switched on in us many times a day whether it's through a kind word from somebody else or a tesky word from somebody else whether it's through advertising or through something we see in the street we are very fluid in our values and this shapes our desires so again bringing this cognitive science into the heart of economic theory has really shaken up that old model of rational economic and in a wonderful way and i'd say this is probably the richest area that new economic thinking has most pervaded and helped start to reshape economic thought. So your your fourth point is that we should get savvy with systems. Uh, and we mentioned supply and demand earlier. Um, and you, But you say that supply and demand is rooted in misplaced 19th century metaphors of mechanical equilibrium. So, um, I mean, that's that's a pretty strong statement, uh, especially about the uh, such a bedrock model. So uh, do you care to defend it? Yeah, well, again, it's fascinating when you go back to the roots of where these models came from and the read the writings of the thinkers who were devising them at the time. So in the UK context, it was William Stanley Jevons, who was uh, one of the core thinkers behind um, deriving the demand curve and this sort of marginal revolution thinking. And he and others, Leon Valras um, in Switzerland, they were determined to make economics a respectable science as physics, and very explicit about this, and drawing very clear metaphors from Newtonian physics, just as in physics uh, a ball will roll to rest and be drawn to rest by the powers of gravity. So within the market, prices will play that role in drawing the market to equilibrium. So they literally took an analogy from physics about equilibrium thinking and things moving to rest and tried to model the economic world on that basis. Interestingly, I think Jevons himself actually realized that it was more dynamic than that. And he wanted to, he, he realized the end goal was actually to be able to model a dynamic system, but because the mathematics didn't exist at the time to do that, he settled for what he saw as sort of next best, which is sort of comparative statics. But actually, ultimately that has led him far from the ultimate goal. So not only did they draw these diagrams very much in the style of Newton, if you look at Jevons's own diagrams of deriving the demand curve, he's drawn exactly in the style with which Newton drew the trajectory of a falling object. So it's, again, intentionally visually mimicking physics uh, using the language. So when we think about the language we talk about markets in, we talk about market forces, again, like those Newtonian forces. We talk about the market mechanism. We talk about equilibrium, all this language. George Lakoff, the cognitive scientist, would be jumping all over this saying, listen, don't you see the framing is, is implicitly trying to say this is just like Newtonian physics. And of course, the reality is we've realized it isn't because Jevons was right in the beginning. Markets are dynamic. And if you really want to get into understanding the movement of markets, you need to embrace complexity thinking, the dynamics um, of feedbacks, of emergent properties, of everything that everyone's seen in action since the financial crisis made it so obvious that it was impossible to ignore. But the thinking, again, I, when I say to any of my students or indeed whenever I give a lecture, I say to everybody, what's the first diagram you learn in economics? Like a snap, everybody says supply and demand. And I say, show me with your fingers. And a whole room full of little fingers goes up making this cross. It's this totem of, of cross that's deeply embedded in our visual cortex, this idea of equilibrium thinking. And yet we, we're coming to realize, and the, the wonderful rise of complexity economics is saying it's not like that at all. It's the wrong kind of science. And if you want to really see the patterns of the economy and indeed of the world, you need to embrace complexity thinking. So we need to let go not only of this idea that the market has some sort of mechanical equilibrium to which it will return, which encourages a sort of laissez-faire mentality, but also to let go of the idea that we can therefore uncover economic laws of motion, because I think that's the, the most pernicious 
thought that has come out of the attempt to base economics on physics is just as Newton discovered these world-changing laws of motion, can we economists find economic laws of motion, find, find these laws, these uh, iron ways in which economies evolve, and that will help us to make sense of the world. And I think the belief that we've found economic laws of motion has really led us uh, in a very destructive direction, both in terms of the environment and social justice over the last 50 years, let's say, particularly. Yeah, uh, you kind of wonder the the modern equivalent of, you know, or Je Jevons worrying that the, the math doesn't exist. The modern equivalent of his models would be dynamic stochastic general equilibrium, which the math for which is derived from rocket science. So it, we're sort of falling into the same traps just uh, now at a more, I guess, advanced level. Um, the the third person in that marginal revolution, though, is uh, Karl Menger, who he, he, he sort of discovered marginal analysis and the marginal way of thinking without so many references to physics. But I, I guess the as sort of a you know, tragic turn of history. Um, he wrote in German and, you know, 40 years later, Germany loses a world war. And then, you know, 20 years after that, they lose another, um, or yeah, 30 years after that, they lose another world war. And, and, uh, and a lot of German language economics sort of falls by the wayside. But, you know, you, one, one wonders if we would be quite so mechanistic in our approach, if, if, you know, history had maybe if the world wars hadn't happened, and if if there had been more collaboration between German and English and French speaking economists. No, oh, it's a really nice point, and I think it's it's a very nice point. It it, it shows again that the, so the economists, when I look again, look back at the diagrams that shape my own education, and ask where did they come from, who did they come from, they are predominantly, unsurprisingly, at first English and Scottish. And then North American. Um, and it, again, it's a very English language tradition. And of course, economics could have and has evolved in many, many other languages. But this Anglo-American tradition has really become the dominant one in the world. And I, I think that's a great point of what would have happened, actually, if it had embraced wider languages. Um, so it wasn't just the, the shaped mindset of wealthy, white, northern, Anglo-speaking men but also embraced other language groups. But what if it embraced um, other indigenous perspectives of what the economy is and the household is? What if it embraced female economists from the start? So there's a wonderful anthropology of the evolution of economics and whose ideas and whose interests and mindsets shaped it. So I, I love the idea of uh, what if there had been no World War, perhaps uh, Karl Menger's work would have been so much more central and could have changed that. We could be looking at different diagrams today. Yeah, and... I, I'm just from my own experience as a, a PhD student, there are three native English speakers in my department and everyone else, uh, their native languages are, you know, Mandarin or Farsi or French, you know, other things, but we all speak in English and we all do economics in English because, you know, now English is the lingua franca of, of economics and uh, mm. prob mm. probably always will be, even if more people speak Mandarin, that's, that's where our our ideas are all laid out in English and everyone from all over the world now learns English before they learn economics, uh, at least at the advanced mm, level. And where I teach, I'm teaching a group of 35 students at the Environmental Change Institute in Oxford. Um, they are, they're studying environmental change and management. They are from all over the world. There, I'd say um, about eight of them are have English as a first home language. Um, but again, it's all taught in English and it's the English mindset. But what I, what is interesting, though, is in this going back to the first point about the search for new understandings of well-being. Now, I think through that lens, there is an opening, certainly in the community, that's the well-being community is looking for what is the economy for asking that question? Can we redefine the goal is looking to other cultures and other ways of defining it. So. For example, the Buen Vivir, the, the living well movement from Latin America has a very strong economic philosophy, which is very much uh, the inter interdependence and integration of human well-being within ecological well-being um, and the interdependence of humanity on the ecological systems around us. Completely different mindset. But again, it's in Spanish and it's coming from Latin America and different cultures of economics rising up. So I hope that I don't know whether economics will always be expressed first in English, but certainly that other cultures 
concepts of the economy start to permeate and enrich this so that we get a much more diverse palette from which to draw 21st century economics. So moving on to your fifth point, uh, your fifth way of thinking like a 21st century economist, it's you say we need to design to distribute. And this is your point about inequality. So tell me about that. Yeah. So going back to this point about um, searching for laws of motion, this this desire to find some underlying movement or motion of, the, of the, how the economy moves. Simon Kuznets in 1955 thought he might have found a law of motion. Um, he took some data on Gini coefficients um, in a handful of countries and plotted it and said, I think I might have seen a pattern here. Uh, to be fair to Kuznets, because I think he was an absolutely brilliant economist and, and everything he did that's been so influential, he heavily caveated from whether it was GDP or indeed the Kuznets curve. And he said, look, I've got scant data here. Um, it would be terrible if anyone drew unwarranted dogmatic generalizations from what I'm saying. <laughs> Famous last words. Um, my idea is 5% empirical and 95% speculation, he said, and tainted by wishful thinking. These are all his words. But I think I've seen a pattern here. I think the pattern is that as economies get richer, i.e. as GDP per capita rises, first they become more unequal and then they become more equal. Now, this actually went against his own intuition because he thought, hmm, uh, is it about, um, well, he thought surely that the capital holders will get higher returns to capital. So, you know, capital accumulates and so you get the sort of success for the successful feedback loop. So this is against what I expect. So he tried to explain it to himself and he ended up trying to explain it in terms of perhaps it's a phenomenon of rural to urban migration. Perhaps if rural areas are, are largely egalitarian and as more people start uh, migrating to the cities, then a wage gap opens up between the rural and the urban. But then as enough workers have migrated to the cities, they start to organize in unions and they start to lobby for a minimum wage for themselves and close that gap up again. Now, that was his attempt to explain it. It actually turned out to be wrong because, and he admitted that uh, he had absolutely no basis for claiming that rural incomes were egalitarian in the first place. It just, that was the theory he could try to imagine. And he gave us all the caveats in the world, but the idea just took root that the Kuznets curve, which again, every student encounters that inequality rises and then falls. And it, it fitted, I think, a very convenient place in the mindset that said the economy has this de facto goal of continual GDP growth. So if inequality is opening up, don't worry. Simon Kuznets has told us it has to get worse before it can get better and more growth will make it better. And if you look at the uh, the economic narratives of, let's say, neoliberal thinking that's dominated over the last 30-something years, largely since the 1980s, that is exactly the thinking at the heart of it. I, I call it the no pain, no gain philosophy. Is, you know, Schwarzenegger made, made this famous as a workout route. You've got to endure pain to break through to um, a better health for all in the end. But this was turned into economics, that we've got to endure pain and tighten our belts. We've got to endure inequality and we will get into the sunny uplands of somehow a richer and more equal society. It just turns out, thanks to Thomas Piketty, it's been very now very carefully documented. It just doesn't happen like that. And the reason that Kuznets found this was that he was measuring it at a particularly un unusual moment in 1955. Um, and the, the greater equality that he was finding in high income countries like the UK and Germany and the US, it was really as a result of large public spending. It was a capital depletion during the, the Second World War, um, massive waves of public spending. So he was measuring uh, a fall in inequality at a particular moment in history. And it was due to war and government intervention that it happened that way. It was not at all an economic law of motion he'd found. I, I believe if you were alive today and had the full spectrum of data that's become available since he was working, he would be the first to chuck out this apparent law of motion. And he would scratch out this, this Kuznets curve um, and say, you know, I warned you, don't make unwarranted dogmatic generalizations. So we need to ditch this Kuznets curve because it's a law of motion that does not exist in the economy. And I, I feel that there's a very profound career change that economists need to take on to stop trying to be like physicists looking for laws of motion and actually become more like architects seeking to design and tweak the design of a 
complex system, or maybe perhaps not architects, even gardeners, um, from engineers to gardeners, because it's about designing the fundamental institutions through which value is created and flows that we can create an economy that's more distributive by design rather than believing that growth will just deliver it in the end. So we can think about how money is created and distributed, how land is um, controlled and how the value of rising land is shared, who creates and owns enterprises and technologies and ideas, going back to the intellectual property that we were talking about earlier. These are design choices uh, about how you set these things up and they can all be adjusted. In fact, there's many really interesting innovations in each of these areas, like, for example, in the space of enterprise, moving away from enterprises being owned by shareholders to enterprises that are employee owned and worker owned. That transforms the distribution of the returns from that business. So there are many really interesting ways that we could design an economy to be distributive by design rather than assuming that more growth will, will uh, deal with the inequality because it doesn't happen. Yeah, uh, we could probably talk for three hours about just inequality alone, but I'll, I'll make oh, uh, yes. make uh, one point about uh, Kuznets in 1955, looking back at uh, the, the apparent fall in inequality. There's some uh, mm -hmm. very recent work by my friends uh, Phil Magnus and Vincent Galoso, who are showing that a lot of the inequality statistics from that period are actually driven by changes in tax laws. And of course... When you, when you change the tax law, people change the way they report their income. And so what, what they're showing is that it's possible that if Kuznets were looking at that data now and taking account of, of the changes in tax laws and the changes in, in uh, the way people file their taxes and who files their taxes, he might not even have seen any fall in inequality at all from the 30s to the 50s. Um, I mean, that's very it's very new research but uh but it's you know it's possible that um you know that it'll it'll be interesting to see when it comes out it's but it it seems like um even the the empirical basis for that original kuznets curve is very shaky in in a lot of ways um, oh that's fascinating because you see again uh, you were saying earlier about Karl Menger if only his uh, german writing had been acceptable and read in english how that could have transformed things if he if if uh, kuznets had had access to different data mm -hmm. he would never have suggested this curve and this again i i, I profoundly believe in the power of, of images this upside down U shape that we all know becomes imprinted in the visual cortex and um, is still there. In fact, a paper uh, just uh, two years ago, IMF staff saying that they were very frustrated because the idea of a trade-off between redistribution and growth seemed deeply embedded in policymakers' consciousnesses. And you think, well, yeah, it is. <laughs> it's called the Kuznets curve. And once it's there, it's quite hard to dislodge. You have to do a lot of extra work to dislodge it. So that sounds like a great paper, I think poor Simon Kuznets would be tearing his hair out to find the because he was a brilliant man and the uh, inheritance, the, the legacy that's been left behind, he would want to come and clean it up himself, I am sure Yeah, well, let's move on to your sixth point, which relates to a, a different Kuznets curve, the environmental Kuznets mm -hmm. curve. Uh, you say we need to create to regenerate. What, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so again it's, the, it's that search for economic laws of motion and, and ironically, just as the Kuznets curve of inequality in the early 1990s that enough data was coming through to say, actually, the pattern is there is no pattern. Uh, this isn't a law of motion. Just as the inequality Kuznets curve was losing its shine, a new Kuznets curve came center stage. Um, 1995 by Grossman and Kruger, they said, oh, in terms of pollution, we think we found a pattern. We think we found this law of motion. And it looks remarkably like the Kuznets curve. So let's call it the environmental Kuznets curve. And it is that when it comes to pollutants, as an economy grows, as its income per capita rises, it gets worse and then it gets better. It follows this upside down U shape. Again, they put in caveats. We realize that we're only looking at local pollutants. Uh, we don't have data on global pollutants, um, but it seems to be following this path. And again, it was adopted as if it was a law of motion. So the World Bank study began to say, OK, if this is a law of motion, at what point will different countries turn? And they started doing these incredibly intricate calculations, finding it, you know, three and a half thousand dollars, the uh, black soot pollution will start to clear up, for example, um, as if just wait until you hit this uh, income per capita threshold and things will start to clear themselves up. Again, it, it takes the onus away from 
creating a design that inherently thinks about humans' interaction with the living world and says, don't worry, when it comes to pollution, it's got to get worse before it gets better and growth will make it better. And so environmental concerns are dismissed as sort of environmental alarm calls and these environmentalists don't understand economics. In fact, it turns out that it might be true for local pollutants, but it is not at all looking like it's true for global pollutants, whether it's um, in terms of climate change, carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions. Countries are not showing automatically that they go through this U process. It's an extraordinary international political process that we're going through trying to negotiate new rules and standards to begin to turn the curve. But even if we were to turn that curve, it's turning at far too high a peak. If you want to think about it in terms of the ecological footprint, countries that are, have high incomes today have a, you know, ecological footprint of sort of living on three, four, five planets. We cannot possibly afford for every low and middle income country to follow that trajectory and need to sort of live on the footprint of five planets before it begins to come down again. So again, we need to switch away from this idea that don't worry, like a well-trained child, pollution will clean up after itself because it doesn't. It often just gets displaced elsewhere in the world. And we need to switch again, thinking like a designer, thinking about the living world in which the economy is based and this takes me actually back to the circular flow diagram, which is floating on a white background. And ecological economists would say the one thing we ask you to do to that circular flow diagram is to draw a circle around it and label it the environment to recognize that the economy is a subsystem of the living world. Humanity's drawing in of resources and spewing out of pollutants is a subsystem of the living world. We're drawing on Earth's sources and filling her sinks. And the moment you recognize that nature of the economy being a subsystem, a new question kicks in, which is how big can the throughput of that subsystem be before it starts to disrupt the very feasibility of the stability of life on this planet? A uh, question that's extremely pertinent today in all the ways that uh, planet systems are being deeply disrupted. So we need to switch to being regenerative by design. And by that, I would say that today's economy is degenerative by default. 200 years of industrial activity, ignoring this, this, uh, the living world and it, its systems and not having that earth system science in place to, to understand it fully, has been based on a linear model where we take earth's resources, we make them into stuff we want, we use it for a while, and then we throw it away. So it's a take, make, use, lose structure, linear through earth systems. The trouble is it's absolutely counter to the living processes of earth. If you look at the way the earth works, it's a cyclical process, continually cycling carbon, water, oxygen, nitrogen, the building blocks of life are continually being used, going round and round in cycles. And yet humanity has been living in a linear way, cutting through that. And we're now bearing the, the, <laughs> the uh, outcome of that degenerative design. We need to transform from this degenerative by default into a way of living on Earth that is regenerative by design, that actually respects the living processes of the Earth and realizes that we can't have a mentality of using resources up, but that we need to use them again and again. And one way of doing that, one way has been captured in thinking about having a circular economy. I would call it a cyclical economy because resources can cycle through the value chain multiple times. And you can divide your thinking about Earth's resources into two sides. One is the bi biological resources, whether it's wood, fiber, food, anything that's growing organic and part of the biological cycle. And so that's why we need to capture food waste in our kitchens and then send it back into a food waste recycling process, whether you do it in your back garden or it goes back to an industrial process that can then capture biogas and then turn that food waste back into soil. So you're cycling the living organic matter of earth. But also there's a technical material side like plastics or metals or ceramics and materials that can be used again and again. And we need to think about designing circular processes where those materials aren't thrown away, but they are re refurbished, recycled. And recycling is the last thing you want to do. You actually want to reuse, refurbish, um, and remanufacturing them. Some cutting edge companies are now basing their business practices on this. So Caterpillar, who make tractors and construction materials, some of their product lines, they actually do remanufacturing. They call it reman, where they bring back their products and they use the vast majority of parts can be reused again um, and resold. And they, they're finding it's actually one of their most profitable lines. So there's value in this for, for today's companies. For me, the real excitement, though, about 
thinking about regenerative design is asking ourselves, if I start not from an economic perspective of today's business or financial markets, but I start from the perspective of a designer and say, what would a regenerative system look like? Then you can ask what kind of economic institutions and laws and enterprises would most best enable that. And I'll give one example. Let's go back to open source. There's the open source circular economy movement which are a group of um, activists in this area who are saying, if we truly believe we're going to create a circular economy, surely it makes sense that a material, uh, let me say a, an old computer, I find an old computer, it ends up in my hands. There should be some way, something encoded into the materials of that computer that I, the person whose hands they end up in, I can read the recipe. I can read the materials, what went into that. And I know the materials that are in my hand and I can then put them back into cyclical processes so that the material use would be open source. That's actually completely different from the way that the regenerative design is happening at the moment because companies want to bring the materials back into their own supply chain. So they want you to return the products to them. So we've got, again, going back to our discussion, it's about intellectual property over the materials and those cycles We're actually full regenerative design, I believe, can only be unleashed if we have a regenerative economic mindset. This is another example, but for a 21st century economist who says economics is about household management, I'm excited about managing our planetary household for the 21st century. One of the most exciting questions is, what kind of intellectual property rules, what kind of enterprise design, what kind of state support and enabling can enable a regenerative system to take off? Right. Uh, we're running a little low on time, but uh, I, I eager to get to all seven of your points. So I want to re- respond to your point about uh, about creating to regenerate and tie it into your seventh way of thinking, like a twenty first century economist, which you say to be agnostic about growth. So a lot of the criticisms of growth, I think, think about growth in one particular way, which is you know they sort of picture it as you know, bigger and deeper strip mines, sort of you using more resources. A lot of growth is, you know, the computer sitting at my feet is made of roughly the same things that a computer from 1995 was, you know, petroleum products, metals. Um, and, and yet it's, you know, several orders of magnitude more powerful. And so it's this, there's two sides to growth. There's, there's getting more resources, but there's also using them better. And, uh, satisfying our subjective you know desires in in just a, a better way with the resources we have so um and i i guess and to to add just one more point about growth is that one one sort of thing we try to impress on young people studying economics is that a, a small change in in the rate of growth can have a huge impact over a long enough time span so Going from 2% growth to 3% growth means that my grandchildren 70 years from now are eight times as rich as I am instead of four times as rich. So another doubling in the 70-year period. But, you know, if if we're agnostic about growth, I just – I worry that 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 sort of – that a lot of the things we're doing to help the environment, you know, maybe they might not be a good trade-off against growth because – my my grandchildren who are eight times richer than I am, maybe they're better able to to you know geoengineer a better climate uh, than than my grandchildren who are two percent uh, or th- who are four times as rich as I am. And so there, I, I sort of see um, there there may be a trade off between uh, in the environment and growth, or or there you know they may be complementary. But so- sometimes it, it may be it may be the right choice to choose growth over the environment. So I guess t- tell me what your your thoughts are on on growth and uh, as they relate to your your sixth point about um, regenerative economy. Okay, so um, this question of growth it's one of the most deepest parts of the economic paradigm we have today, and also of course one of the ones that's seen as most foolish to challenge. And it would have been very easy for me to write this book without talking about this and to stick with a growth paradigm um, and and be much more acceptable in the mainstream. But I decided to embrace that because I have become so aware that we are so surrounded by and immersed in a growth-centric economic paradigm. But if you step outside of economics and look in any other field, whether it's ecology, biology, you'll see that 
nothing in nature grows forever. Uh, growth is a very healthy phase of life, but it's a phase through which any other living system grows and then reaches a maturity and thrives at maturity. So I find it a fascinating starting question to ask ourselves, why wouldn't we expect our economies to do the same? So instead of having a, a GDP curve, which is exponential, because that's, as you described, a 2% two, two or 3%, that'll both of generate exponential curves. Rather than having an exponential growth curve, what if it was an S-shaped curve, sometimes called a logistic curve, that it goes through an exponential phase, but then it begins to taper off and ultimately it plateaus out. Because if we think of any, we, we've recognized, as we were saying earlier, that the economy is a subsystem of the living world. Now, any subsystem that grows indefinitely will either explode or destroy the living system on which it depends, uh, cancer being the most uh, well-known example of that. So it, again, it, it's an anathema within economics to ask these questions because the growth-centric mindset is so strong. In fact, when I reflect back on my own education, we ne over the four years of economics I studied, we never asked whether growth was always necessary. We never asked what might happen if it didn't come, if it wasn't possible. And we never even contemplated looking at whether a, a growth agnostic society could survive, could thrive. And so I'll just be clear about the point that I'm making about being growth agnostic, because some people are advocating degrowth, which seems to be very much we need to allow the GDP to shrink. That, that's not my interest at all. As I've said earlier, I believe we need to shift from looking for laws of motion to focusing on system design. And if we are to thrive in the 21st century and to pull back from the extraordinarily ex extraordinary excessive pressure that we are putting on our planet right now, jeopardizing the future uh, of our civilizations, jeopardizing our grandchildren's future, to be quite blunt about it, we need to redesign our economic system so that it is regenerative by design and that it is distributive so that it can meet the needs of all. To me, these are the design principles of the 21st century economy. We stop looking for laws of motion, we move to design principles. I would put those first, and there's a there can be a trade-off and a dance between those principles. But then, what is GDP growth? It's the increase in the value of goods and services exchanged in the market economy. And we've, as we've already discussed, there's far more than that. There's the market, oh, and the market and the, the state, that will show up. The household doesn't show up, as you said quite rightly about the housekeeper, that won't show up if you marry her. And the commons doesn't show up. Now, if we're serious about looking at regenerative and distributed design through the potential of open source, if it goes open source, it may well not show up. The full value won't show up. Even the value, as you just described, of your computer, the full value of your computer doesn't show up in its price because it, its value has increased far more than its price because of the, the innovation that's gone into it. So price and, and the market value actually doesn't reflect what we know. And everybody admits that GDP is actually a pretty lousy measure of economic success. So I believe we need to move to a world in which we are pursuing the design principles of regenerative and distributive economies that enable us to thrive within that donut and that GDP becomes an adjustment variable. In that transition, as we move to, to a renewable energy future with zero fossil fuel use, which we have to do, what will happen to GDP in that future? Perhaps it'll initially go up. I, no doubt it will because we need to invest in renewable energy. But if that renewable energy were distributed peer-to-peer -peer energy systems, uh, even embedded in the commons, perhaps the value of the electricity flowing through it in some economic circumstances might not turn up in the market. So GDP could go up and then flatten. It could go down and then up. If we are continually driven by a GDP that must increase, we don't give ourselves the space to redesign our economies to be regenerative and distributive. And that's my fear about GDP because we are currently locked into an eco economy with its institutions, laws, and culture that is addicted to GDP growth. We're addicted financially through the rate of return, through positive interest rates. We're addicted politically because governments hope to raise tax revenue without raising taxes. Well, to do that, you need the economy and GDP to grow, and that'll give you a, a larger tax revenue year on year. Uh, we're addicted also politically through fear of the unemployment line because the only situation we know when GDP stops growing or goes down is you get this massive unemployment line. Again, that's about the structure of enterprise and the structure of workers' relationships to enterprise. That can be restructured. 
And we're also uh, addicted politically because I, I think of the G20 photograph that's taken every year, and I call it the G20 family photo. Every leader who makes it into that photo guards their position there jealously. And no leader wants to be bumped out of the picture because the next East Asian powerhouse came up and their GDP actually became bigger than an old European nation, for example. So there is a collective action problem that every nation is engaged in goes back to Kuznets in, in the 50s and the USSR versus the US. We're all engaged in this pursuit of increasing our GDP for global market position, but also global geopolitical and military position. So that's a really critical lock-in. I wish a lot more folks in international relations were thinking about how do we overcome that collective action problem that we are collectively engaged in pursuing an unending GDP growth. Lastly, I believe we're locked in socially. Uh, after a century of consumerism, we have we have been told and advertised and come to partly believe that a better life means more spending power. So your grandchildren, if we have 2% growth or 3% growth, the 3% growth might make them eight times as financially rich in terms of their income. But will they be given how that economy is designed, will they be as rich in their community connections? Will they be as rich in their the way they engage in the commons? Will the environment be a thriving environment? There is a true cost to pursuing a GDP growth if it's based on degenerative design. It will literally destroy the living systems on which all of our lives depend. We need to recognize the economy and that GDP measure as a subsystem of the living world and ask ourselves, at what point is it mature? And can we have an economy today? Today, we have an economy that needs to grow, whether or not it makes us thrive. What we need this century, I believe, is an economy that makes us thrive, whether or not it grows. Generations of economists before us never had to ask themselves this extraordinarily challenging question. Again, I think this is what makes it exciting to be an economist in the 21st century. We're asking unprecedented questions. It's a time to overthrow the old presumptions of theory. And I believe it's a time to overthrow the presumption of deep cent growth centric theory that we have and question growth. So I throw in this question of being agnostic about growth because I think we need to challenge ourselves on the deepest assumptions of what the economy is and is for. My guest today has been Kate Rayworth. Kate, thanks for being part of Economics Detective Radio. It's my pleasure. Thank you.